Welcome to Journey Church. Our church exists to help people find God, experience freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. If you have any questions about Journey Church, please visit us at OurJourney.tv. Now, here's Pastor Vince Farrell. Well, good morning, everyone. And those of you watching online, we are so glad that you're here with us. We are in week three of what we're calling the Four Cups. And this morning, I want to talk to us about the cup of sanctification. There's four cups that we've kind of had on this table to kind of symbolize what each cup means and represents. And over the last couple weeks, I've kind of just laid the foundation. And if you're just joining us, I want to kind of bring us up to speed. There is a book called The Four Cups, written by Pastor Chris Hodges, um, who titled the book Four Cups. And as I was reading this, I really felt the Holy Spirit give me some direction and guidance for us as a church. Now, last week, we learned that it's Jesus and Jesus alone that is the perfect, the sacrificed, the shared Passover lamb. Amen? Because each one of these uh, promises that God gave the nation of Israel, uh, He spoke these through Moses. And these are promises that you and I need to know. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, why do I need to know these? Well, it's very simple, because you and I are on a spiritual journey. Whether you know it or not, you're on a journey. I'm on a journey. If I could say it kind of bluntly, and and, and the truth of the matter is, you right now are are either moving closer to God or moving farther away from God. That's just how it is. Because life is moving, because you're growing or shrinking, you're on a spiritual journey. And so because of that, you need to know these four promises. They're given to us in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. It says, Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is God speaking, and He says, Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I love what God does because he gives us step number one. Everyone say step number one. Here it is. Here's the first step. And what's interesting to to understand about the first step is he does not say, step one, I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to change you. Step one, I want you to go to church more. Step one, I want you to do the things less that you're not supposed to do. Step one doesn't say any of that. Now, now please hear me, because you got really uh, quiet like I had just squashed the classroom turtle. (laughs) Those steps are important, but, but they come later. So I don't know if you've ever been out witnessing and sharing your faith. I sure have. And when I talk to people, one of the pushbacks I get when it comes to, hey, why don't you come to church with me? We have an awesome thing happening at Journey Church. The pushback is, well, I'm just, I'm just not where I need to be right now. Yeah. What? <laughs> then you're a candidate <laughs> for the promises of God. Right. You, you, step one is not get your life right, then come. And I will, it, it's, I will bring you out. He goes on to say, I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I, I, listen, I will bring you out is cup one. We talk, we're going to talk about this morning. It's sanctification, okay? And, and, and that bringing out of this yoke or bondage. Step two, I will free you. That means <laughs> you can belong here. You can, you can belong to the house, to the people of God. I will redeem you. Oh, this has to do with deliverance. Before you flash back to... <laughs> deliverance has to do with getting the world out of you. Step one is you coming out of the world. Freeing you, step two. Step three, deliverance. 
Now, statistics say that 87% of Christians get stuck on step three and never go into step four. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. This is full of redemption. This is full of purpose. And what's interesting is that he says, then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Then you will know. I will establish you. All these promises, all these cups, if you will, all three of them says, I and you, I and you. You get to cup number four, and it's I and y'all. Plural. There's something to be said when people come together. Living in a fulfilled life with a group of people makes a difference. Amen? Amen. Then you will know. See, these promises push us to, to an understanding. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out. Now, these four cups, if I could just make them into one word to kind of help us track, it would, it would read as this. It would read cup number one deals with salvation. Cup number two deals with freedom. Cup number three deals with restoration, and cup number four deals with fulfillment. And like I said, a lot of times we get stuck in this continuous cycle of being restored because we do good for a while, and then we slip, and we fall, and we get back into the same mess that we were in, and so we go back and forth, and and really God wants to redeem all of us, get us out of that lifestyle so we can then experience a fulfilled life. I don't know about you, but I'm a candidate for wanting a fulfilled life. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to just play church. Mm, Good preaching. So let's, let's look back at our key scripture verse. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. If you don't know the historic story, Israel was outgrowing the Egyptians. And this made Pharaoh of that time go into a panic. And so he reasoned that it would be good to put the Israelites, God's people, God's chosen people, into bondage, into slavery. Now, I want to make this statement to help us understand something, that the same evil spirit that engulfed Pharaoh to provoke such hatred among God's people is the same spirit that is among us today, moving throughout our nation. And now, I want us to understand that while slavery does deal with someone owning someone else, there's a much simpler understanding that I want us to bring into this conversation, if you will, as we move forward. And that is this. Slavery, in its simplest definition, is submission to a dominant influence. Slavery is submission to a dominant influence. So when we look at what Pharaoh did to God's people, I want to parallel this morning three things that he did that is happening among us today. The first thing that Pharaoh did is he forced as slaves to make bricks. He forced the children of Israel into bondage, in slavery, having dominance over them, and then he forced them to make bricks. Now... When it comes to this understanding of us today, many of us in this room, we're making bricks. As slaves, there's a dominant power over our life, and we're just making bricks. Now, it's important to understand what Jesus says about this. He said to them, I am telling you the truth that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. See, that's the brick making. When when we engage in sinful activity, it's as if we're just going through the motions, making bricks. A slave does not belong to a family permanently, but a son belongs forever. 
This is the good news translation. I love how the Amplified says it because it says everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And that word, a slave, a habitual sinner. Please understand the difference. It's one thing to be on the road, to be on the journey, and some temptation you fall into, and and you repent and ask God to forgive you, and you don't do it anymore. That's one type of sin. The other type of sin is when you do it and go, well, God still loves me, and then you keep doing it. What Scripture is saying, what Jesus is saying, that type of sinning, you've stepped out of being a son. You've stepped out of being a child. And you're stepping into being a slave. The thing about being bound to something, being a slave to something, is it tells you how to live your life. I mean, every single one of us, I think, have either had to make a payment to something one time or another. I have never gotten thank you cards and letters from my mortgage company. <laughs> they don't care. But, but, but if I'm late, they, I get letters. Anyone else? And so, so Scripture says that the lender becomes the slave owner. And maybe you're here this morning and, man, you're making payments for cars, you're making payments for vehicles, you're making payments to uh, refrigerators, you're making payments to all this stuff. And at the end of the month, you're like, I just don't have enough money. Why? Because the person who owns you, the companies that own you, they're telling you what to do with your money. They're telling you how to live your life. So it's the best thing we can do to get out from underneath that type of bondage. Amen? Well, the same, same as emotionally. Because, because maybe you're here this morning and, and when it comes to being enslaved, you've said things like this. You've said, I feel trapped. I, I, feel, I feel in debt, whether it be relationships or expectations of others. Maybe it's guilt, fear, anger. Maybe you're harboring bitterness. Maybe it's your schedule. Maybe it's habits that you have that that you just legitimately feel trapped and and there's nothing you can do. Everyone who is a slave to sin ends up serving that sin. The second thing that Pharaoh did, not only did he cause them to make bricks, and, and certainly that spirit is here today trying to entrap us, trying to steal our time, our freedom, our joy, our peace. And so brick by brick, we're building our own demise. The second thing Pharaoh did is he murdered all the male babies. It says that the nation of Israel was outgrowing Israel, and so he called for all the baby boys to be killed. Now, I don't be political, but I'll say it very open and honestly that babies are still being killed today. All throughout history, the devil has always tried to kill children. Why? What, what do children represent? Very simply, children represent the future. Children represent potential. And this represents what the devil tries to do you, to you and I. To destroy the potential that's in us. If he can keep us under his thumb, if he can demolish the hope and desires that we have, the dreams and future, then he's demolished and snuffed out your future. Pharaoh stole their future when he starts killing their children. And it's the same strategy that he tries to do with you and I. He tries to keep us from reaching our potential. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29.11, however, says, For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans that are for peace and well-being. Not for disaster, but to give you future, to to unlock your potential, and a hope. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you've said, you know, why do I feel so unsatisfied? 
and, and you feel empty. You, you feel like you're, something's not clicking right. I would dare to say that the greatest tragedy in life is not death. The greatest tragedy is going your entire life and not knowing your purpose. Why, why don't I feel more in life? I mean, what's the meaning of all this? Why am I here? <clears throat> My mom was very young when she became pregnant with me, unwed mother. And I'm not telling you anything she hasn't shared in her own life testimony. As a 19-year-old, being told in the 70s that you're pregnant, you had options. And so my mom listened to the options that she had. You can't tell the difference between a, a fetus human and a fetus turtle. And so she was in the abortion clinic with me, prepared to abort. She said as she sat there filling out paperwork, she felt a kick. And that kick was me saying, let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and so she gave birth to me. Sacrifices she's had to make over the years have been many. But growing up, hearing that story, I always knew there had to be something more for me than just to survive. And whether or not you were ever in that same situation, the fact that you are breathing, God has a purpose for you. Amen. He know Amen. Give God a hand. Yes. <clears throat> the third thing that Pharaoh did is he required them to collect their own straw. See, up to that point when he had them building bricks, Israel, uh, Egyptians would bring the straw next to the mud pits. Israelites would take the straw, mix it in with the mud, and form bricks. It's how we have the wonders of the world with uh, Pharaoh's temples and, and uh, pyramids. Firmly believe, historic proves it, that children of Israel built those. Requiring them to collect their own straw. So, so he becomes harder with them. They're already working 12-hour days. They're already up at the very crack of dawn, and, and now to make things harder for them, he says, we're not going to collect straw for you. You now have to collect your own straw. I don't know about you. Have you ever been physically exhausted? Exhaustion. <clears throat> Maybe you're here and you'd say, you know what? I'm just tired all the time. I can't keep up with the pace. I'm overloaded. I'm stressed out. I'm, I'm stretched to the limit. My patience is very low. Anyone else suffer from that? I get angry easily. I just want to insert here, church family, that thank you for allowing me to take a sabbatical. And more importantly, thank you for not saying stupid things. Seriously, not one individual from this church said, you're taking a two-month vacation? Thank you for not being stupid. I mean that. I think if someone said that to me, I probably would have come unglued because I had been exhausted. I was becoming easily angered. I was feeling exhausted all the time, even though I'm passionate about what I do. <clears throat> I fell victim to trying to collect my own straw rather than let God provide it for me. See, we all go through this cycle if we step into what the enemy has planned for us. And you may be here today saying, man, I'm just, I'm just worn out all the time. And you may be on edge, not knowing when's this going to stop. Understand that it's your enemy that's trying to put you in bondage make you feel enslaved, make you feel empty, make you feel exhausted. Because the devil knows if he can keep you emotionally and physically spent, then you're no good for kingdom work. 
Because let me just insert here, exhaustion is not a time issue. It's a spiritual issue. You ever go on vacation and you come back and you're like, I need a vacation from my vacation? It wasn't because you had plenty of time to rest. It's because your soul is at war. I love how Chris Hodges says it in his book. He says, rest is not inactivity. It's a condition of the soul. And maybe you're here and you're emotionally and physically spit. I I would say to you, watch out because that's a recipe for sin. When you feel burnout, it's not because you're doing too much. It's because you're doing too much with no purpose. If you're tired and exhausted, then you're a candidate for God's promises. John 10.10, Jesus says... The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give life and to its fullness. Romans 8.11, it stands to reason, and this is the Message Bible, I love how this reads. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life. He'll do the same thing that He did in Jesus. I mean, isn't that pretty basic? The God that resurrected Jesus from the grave, that power that took to resurrect Jesus lives in you. Bringing you alive to Himself. Let me go on. It says, when God lives and breathes in you, and and He does do this, you are delivered from the dead life. With His Spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as it was for Christ. Let me give you one more. I just love this. 1 Peter 1, 3, 5, because I know you're writing this down, taking photos of it. You're going to go back and study this later. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. Amen? That's good news right there. Including, including a future in heaven. And also, right now, the life that you and I can have, the cup of sanctification, if you will. This cup, once we've drank from it, then we're supposed to help others drink from that cup. In other words, we're supposed to help people find God. Now, as we, as we talk about this cup of sanctification, the first promise that God gives to us is to bring us out of bondage, to bring us out of this old lifestyle of making bricks, killing our future, and being exhausted. So once we've drank from this cup, how do we help others drink from this cup? I'm going to give you three points real quick. Number one, you have to change directions. You're here this morning, you're on a journey, maybe you're going down the wrong road. Maybe you're trying to do it through your own talent, through your own skill, through your own trying, and that's why you're exhausted. The the Bible word for this is the word repent. See, you've got to make a decision that you're tired of where you are Because you can't be in both places at the same time. You're going to be either for God or you're not. You're going to do it His way or your way. And it's time for you to move. It's time to help help other people move. It's not in your notes, but you can jot this down. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 says, Therefore, come out from them and be separate. So come out is what He does first says the Lord, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be the father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. You've got to change directions. If you're doing things in life that are ungodly, then just stop and start doing godly things. Which which leads to number two. Surrender. Oh, I I fully understood 
that no one was going to clap and cheer for this one, okay? So, no, 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 it's not going to happen because none of us like to let it go. I'll tell you a quick story. There was a young lady who was separated from the rest of the world because every time she would touch something, it would turn to ice. And this young lady had to let it go. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. I, I, I couldn't. Because you were thinking it, weren't you? <laughs> None of us want to not be in control. I mean, if we're going to be really honest, most of the fights that you have in your marriage are over who gets their way. Thank you. I was, I was wondering if that was true. It, it, it's true in my house. Because I want to be right. I want to be in control. I wanna, and, and so does my wife. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we got to turn both of our wants and desires and give it over to God and let Him be in control. And then us sync up with what He wants. Same for your life. You have plans. You have goals, thinking, thoughts. But did you first surrender that to God and then him tell you what he wanted you to do? Ugh. Jesus himself said this in Mark chapter 8, 34 and 35. And again, I'm using the Message Bible because I just love how this reads. It's so blunt and to the point. Jesus said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. <laughs> come on, Jesus. I want to take you into my job. Come on, Jesus. I'm going to take you into my lunch plan. Come on, Jesus. I'm going to take you into my... Mm -mm. It's Jesus and him saying to you, this is what I want you to do concerning this. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Oh. But it hurts. Yeah, it does. That's, that's why you need to be in a group of other believers. Pastor John mentioned we have small group tables. Those aren't just so we can give some people in our church an opportunity to decorate. Those are established so you could get into a group of other believers who aren't perfect, but they're on the journey, they've repented, they're surrendering, and they're in that process, and it hurts and it struggles, but together we can get through it because God is with us. He made us that promise. Self-help is no help at all self-sacrifice that's the way my way to saving yourself your true self Jesus said if you want to gain your life you got to lose it here's the third thing <clears throat> commit your life see church is not about coming together and and just playing a part it's about saying you know what I've committed to learning about Jesus to having a relationship with you him it's not enough to just stop the old way. I love how Pastor Will says this. Pastor Will speaks uh, very often on Tuesdays at the road, deals with people who have addictions. And I love how he said, it, it's not just about stopping. It's about replacing it with something else. I call it the Indiana Jones Principle. Y'all remember in the movie, he's sitting there in front of the idol and he's got the bag of sand. He's trying to figure out how much that golden idol weighs and then he takes the golden idol with the sand to replace it. Well, same thing spiritually. We have a, a friend, a mutual friend, who has overcome through God's grace tons of addictions, drugs, hard stuff. But he's struggling with cigarettes. He's like, God, I, I, I want to overcome this too. And I'm not here to pick on if you smoke or not. That's not the issue. But for this gentleman, he wants to be free from it. And, and I shared with him just a thought. I said, well, I don't know how much do cigarettes cost. And he told me the price. I said, well, here's the thing. Every time you go into the store and you're going to lay down five, six, seven dollars for that pack, instead of doing that, take it, 
put it in your pocket, and then save it, and then Sunday, give it to missions. Just, it, 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 it's hard. You have to replace it with something else. Another way of saying this is that you're no longer a slave to the devil, you're now a slave to God. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, 19. For just as you offered parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. Huh. How do we drink from the cup of sanctification? Whatever you're spending your time, your energy, your worry, your burdens, your money with, doing things that really are going to burn up in the, at the end of life, now spend that time, energy, purpose, money, doing God things. Maybe that $7 that it cost when you buy someone a cup of coffee at the store. You, you, you turn ungodly purchases into godly purchases. If, if that's something you're trying to overcome. So that's, that's what we are in the business of doing. As a church, we want to help people find God. But it's going to happen because they first repent, just like it did for you and me. It's going to happen because we surrender and say, I'm no longer in control. And it's going to happen because we now start doing what God wants us to do rather than what we want to do. Amen? Thank you for being with us online. Our desire is to journey with you however you want to connect with us. We look forward to doing life with you. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week.